Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we bless your name for your love. Thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. Thank you because you have called us by your grace. You have shown us the light of the gospel. All you've done for us, we do not merit. We pray you accept our praises and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as we study today, you help us to appreciate more what you've done for us, what the gospel has made available, and help us, Lord, to live out the life of the gospel that will make your heart glad. And help us to stretch out the hand of love to bring in other people that they too may enjoy with us the grace of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Last week, we started the study of the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Colossians. And we got through the introductory greeting of Paul, the apostle, to the Colossians. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were here last week, you will see we emphasized that there are four normal elements in the greeting of Paul the Apostle, which forms the introduction. One, we have the writer of the epistle itself, Paul the Apostle, called, he became converted, he consecrated himself to the service and ministry of the Lord, and God used him in wonderful ways so that he preached the gospel, proclaimed the name of Christ, planted the church in various parts of the Gentile world, in the then known world. Paul, an apostle, he said. He said he became an apostle, not because somebody nominated him, not because he usurped the authority of another person, not because he had personal aspiration or ambition. He said it was by the will of God. Then he mentioned Timothy, a companion, a brother, a son in the faith, a trusted servant, a trusted fellow laborer. Then he mentioned the believers that he wrote the epistle to at Colossae. And he said something significant about them. Number one, they were saints. They are being saints mean that God had poured down grace and power from above. I told you that is a vertical relationship they had with the Lord. And in that vertical relationship, they had a change, a transformation of life. They became holy. They became righteous in Christ, saints in Christ. But they were not only saints having vertical relationship with the Lord. They were brethren. That is, there was an horizontal relationship between them and other people around them who had received the same like precious faith. Not just that they were brethren in Christ, they were faithful. They were living at Colossae. And I told you that Colossae was a city that had been established about 400 years or 500 years before Christ. And this city had gone on in hedonism and paganism. But then the light of the gospel came to them through Epaphras, 
one of the fellow ministers or one of the faithful ministers of Paul the Apostle. Then Paul the Apostle greeted them and said, Grace be unto you. All our salvation is attributed to the grace of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, the gift of God, as the choir rendered now. And he said, Peace be multiplied unto you. There has been enmity between man and God. But then when Christ came, that wall of partition had been broken down. Now Christ is our peace. And being justified by faith, we are peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, he referred to God as their father. They had sonship. As a result of that grace of God, and Jesus Christ became Lord. They became disciples of the Lord, and they owned the Lordship of the Lord. Now that he had introduced the gospel unto them, he now brought thanksgiving unto God, which is what we're looking at today in Colossians chapter 1, from verse 3 to, to verse 8. Let's look at it. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, a fellow, a dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. If you notice carefully the passage I've read to you from verse 3 to verse 8, you discover it's a long sentence. There is no full stop after verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. The full stop comes at verse 8. That just tells you that all those verses form a single sentence together. They were the same. They were the same verses. That is, those verses form just a single sentence, and it is a single line of thought. But then, in all these, in all these verses, and which forms a single sentence, he gives us the thanksgiving he had on behalf of the Colossian Christian. And he said, they has heard about their faith, of their love. And he also had a new of the hope they heard. And he said, this gospel they had received, has even been publicized or broadcast in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. And they knew that it was by the grace of God. They had learned about it from Epaphras. And Paul the Apostle with his team had learned about their faith also through Epaphras. These are the verses we're looking at today. In this sense given, given by Paul the Apostle, we have the truth about the gospel. If you look at the end of verse 5, it says, The word of the truth of the gospel. The word of the truth of the gospel. And as you look at the thanksgiving of Paul the Apostle, you will see that everything he says in all these verses we have read, they center around the truth of the gospel. That's why we have titled the Bible study today, The Gospel Truth. The Gospel Truth. Now, we say it has this in the note the gospel is the good news the news of victory the best and the greatest news you see in the roman world and in the world at which at the time that paul the apostle lived if there was a battle if there was a great fierce battle and the soldiers had gone from one city to another city incidentally each city had their battalion of soldiers and these cities having their battalion of soldiers, they engaged in war against the cities that were threatening their existence. And now, whenever they had gone for war, all the people in the city will be waiting. And as they waited, now they will be expecting the result of the battle. And somebody will be coming from the battle. If they had won the battle, they will see from the step he takes, from the way he runs, from the way he dresses, from the palm of victory that he has in his hand, he will now be telling them something. And it has just one word in the Greek language. And that Greek word in the English language means the good news, the glad tidings, 
the news of victory. And when he says that word, and that is the word translated gospel in our English Bible, when he says that word, they knew that in that battle that the people had won. You see, from the time of the fall of Adam, there has been a battle raging between humanity and Almighty God. And God sent Jesus Christ. And on the cross of, on the cross of Christ, Jesus died on the cross. And when he said, it is finished, he destroyed principalities and powers. He did everything that needs to be done so that he will rescue man from the hand of the devil. And now the proclaimer comes to tell us, he says, gospel, good news, glad tidings, the news of victory. Jesus Christ has won. He died, he was buried, he rose from the dead, and because he lives, therefore we shall live. That is actually the gospel. And you know, there is truth in the gospel. Whenever even unbelievers are talking and they, are, they want to emphasize that they are telling the truth, you know what they say? They say, I'm telling you what I'm saying is gospel truth. They know that the gospel is the truth. And there is no error. There is no shade of falsehood in the gospel. That's why even unbelievers, even the natural people, they will say, I I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is the gospel truth. But the real truth of the gospel is what we are learning about today. And in that verse 5, Paul the Apostle says, the word of the truth of the gospel. And this gospel we are talking about, as I have explained to you now, the use of the word in the Greek world, it is the good news. It is the best news. It is the greatest news. It is the news of victory. In other episodes, we are given the content of the gospel. In other parts of the New Testament, we are taught on what our response must be to the gospel. What are we supposed to do about the gospel? New Testament tells us, Mark chapter 1 verse 15, Repent, believe ye the gospel. What else are we to do with the gospel? Mark chapter 16 verse 15, Preach the gospel to every creature. What else? Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must not be ashamed of the gospel. And in Philippians chapter 1 verse 17, defend the gospel. Paul the apostle said, I am raised up. I am set up for the defense of the gospel. And in Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, it says, striving together. Together for the propagation of the gospel. You labor for its propagation. And in Philippians chapter 1 verse 5, you are told to enjoy the fellowship in the gospel and in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 12 this we do that we might not hinder the gospel of our lord jesus christ we must not hinder the gospel but we must be divinely empowered to proclaim it paul the apostle said in first thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5 how the gospel came unto you in power and in the ministration of the holy ghost and we shall be willing to suffer for the gospel and we must not allow the gospel to be perverted in any way by anyone paul the apostle said to the uh, galatians he said i marvel that ye are so soon removed from the one that called you unto another gospel which is not another but there are those who will pervert the gospel of our lord jesus christ and he said in chapter 2 of galatians he said we gave them no chance. No, not by the space of one hour, so that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But in this um, Colossian passage that we are studying today, it really tells us a lot about the gospel, which we are going to look at today. Now let's look at them one by one. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we give thanks to God. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Here Paul the Apostle tells us that we receive the gospel by faith. The gospel is the good news. The gospel is the best news. It's the greatest news. It's the news of victory. That Christ has defeated the devil on the cross of Calvary. And now we who have been slaves of the devil, we can now come 
and receive Jesus Christ into our lives and become born again and have the life of Christ within. It tells us that the gospel is now established and we come in to believe God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is received by faith. Let's look at Mark chapter 1. Verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You know what the gospel is? Before Jesus Christ came, there was a God, a chasm, a great, great pitch between humanity and the Almighty God. And no man, by his own effort, can jump to the other side, leave simple humanity in his own strength, get over to the other side, and come into fellowship with the Holy God. But then Jesus Christ came, and is a bridge between sinful humanity and the holy God. And now through that bridge, you can walk on that bridge, having faith in that bridge, that the bridge is able to carry you. You see, when you have a bridge, a long bridge, and as you are joining on, you just ride over the bridge because you have confidence. You have not tested the bridge you have not found out whether it is going to carry you or not, but you have faith, you have trust, you have confidence. And as you ride on, you just ride on straight to get to the other side. That's how we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, in your own strength, in your own power. You cannot reach at the Holy God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Your sins are separated between you and Almighty God. But then Christ has become the bridge. And with faith in Christ, with trust in the Lord, not in our own strength, we take the Lord Jesus Christ, we walk away from sinful humanity, and we walk, we go through Jesus, and now we come to the Father. Humanity or the whole world is like in a burning house. And as it's in a burning house, everybody will be burnt to death if there is no person to rescue. But then here comes somebody that comes to rescue and he's outside the burning house, and he says, look at me here, and be rescued. Jump into my loving hands, and I will take you from the burning house and take you to safety. Jesus Christ is like that. This world is marked down for fire, and uh, the sins of the world will lead people to go into hell fire. But here Jesus comes, and he says, you don't have to burn with the burning world. You don't have to be destroyed with the burning house. And he stretches forth his hand. And you see the mark of his love in his hand. And he says, jump into my hand. You have to have confidence and faith that he has the wisdom. He has the love. He has the power to catch you when you jump. That's the faith. You receive the gospel by faith. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot climb up to heaven by yourself. But Jesus is a ladder by which we can climb up and we can go unto the Father himself. We receive the gospel by faith. It is our faith, our trust, our confidence in the Lord that makes us to become born again, become children of God. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and verse 31, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to the saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. At the time of C.H. Spurgeon, 
something happened in his community. There was a sea, and it became turbulent because of the storm coming on that sea. Then the ship in which people were sailing became wrecked, and people were just falling off the battered, broken ship, getting into the river. And uh, even if they could have swam unto safety, they couldn't because of the storm, because of the waves. But the people at the shore, they knew about it, and they sent the life boat to catch people, to be able to take people from drowning and get them into the life boat and drive them or make them sail to the shore. There were two people in particular. They were struggling around the same place, and the life boat came. And they threw down the rope. They expecting that the, the individuals will catch the rope. And one of them caught the rope. The other fellow, he saw the rope. But then he saw a log of wood. A big log of wood. And he thought it would be safer to hold on to the log of wood. Instead of holding on to the rope. The other fellow held on to the rope. He was pulled into the boat. But the fellow that held on to the log of wood, that log of wood was that man was driven with the wind and driven with the waves and washed up into the depths of the sea. He perished. The one that saw the rope held on to it and held on to it till he went, till he got to the lifeboat and taken to the shore, he was saved. The other fellow drowned because the log of wood is not anchored to the shore. Jesus is the anchor. And if in the storms of life, because of sin, because of all that is happening, you see that you are drowning and judgment will come upon you. Look at Jesus Christ the Messiah. Look at him. If you will hold on to him and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will take you to the lifeboat. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. But you know, that man, he held on to the rope until he got into the lifeboat. If you keep on looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, until we get to heaven, there will be no danger. But if you look away from him, if you lose hold of that rope, if you lose hold of your faith in Christ, and you look back to your log of wood, you look back to your own good works, you look back to all the things you can do by yourself, thinking you will get to heaven on your own good works alone, you'll be lost. But it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now Paul the Apostle continued with the Colossians. He said, number one, the gospel is received by faith. Look at verse 4 again, Colossians chapter 1. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. The gospel results in love. You see, when you are born again, you suddenly see Jesus Christ dying for you on the cross of Calvary. You say, what manner of love is this? That we should be called the sons of God. For so are we. For it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we shall see him, we shall be like him, because we shall see him, and we shall be like him as he is. Because of that manner of love, he first loved us, because of that we love him. When you see him bleeding, when you see him crying, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you see him bearing all the punishment that is due unto you, it will result in love. Once you become born again, you will love him because of what he has done for you. You will love God who has so loved the world and gave his only begotten son. He gave the best that heaven could offer. You know, we deserve judgment. We deserve punishment. We deserve agony, affliction because of our sins. We deserve misery, perdition in this world and in the life to come. But God, only by his grace, not because of what we have done. It is a gift of God. He sent Jesus Christ to die for us. It will result in love in your heart. You will love him. Not only that, you will see other people that have like precious faith and you will love them. We are saved by faith and we are saved to love. This faith in Christ 
will bring us into fellowship with other brethren of like precious faith. This kind of faith will not lead into isolation. You wonder when some people say they are born again. They are, they, they are children of God. But then they are so isolated. They have no relationship with other people. That cannot be so. Because if you have received the gospel by faith, it will result in love. You see what the Apostle Paul said? He said, we heard of your faith in Christ, number one. Then number two, we heard of your love, which ye have to all the saints. Let's look at um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor circumcision, but faith that which worketh by love. You've had faith in the Lord, or love will follow. If you really believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot do without having love for the children of God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It says, the presence of the Holy Ghost in us, that's why the new birth, because he that has not the Spirit of Christ is none of his. The presence of the Holy Ghost in our hearts at the new birth will make the love of God to be shed abroad in your heart. That means every compartment and area of your heart will be filled with love. Because, you know, you are saved by the same blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In human relationship, when you are blood, blood related, you are blood relation of so and so, of so and so, there is that love because of being related by ordinary, natural blood of daddy and mommy. But now you are related to the other fellow by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of that relationship, on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ, you cannot be isolated. You will love the brethren because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. You will love them when they are in affliction. You will love them when they are being persecuted. You will love them when they are in need. You will love them when they are discouraged. You will love them when they are destitute. You will love them when they are poor. You will love them when they have some needs in their lives. You will want to rescue them. You want to come to their aid. You want to come to their help. Because the love of God is shared abroad in your heart towards them. When we receive the gospel, it makes the love of God to be shared abroad in our hearts. You will be with them. You will support them in trial, in affliction. The love of God will be flowing through you to the other brethren if you are really a child of God. We receive the gospel by faith. It results in love in our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 1, from verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. See to it that you love one another Fervently. Fervently. Which means that is a kind of love that you will not be able to hide. Faith will not lead to isolation, but it will lead to non-selective love. What I mean by non-selective love is that you will not be picking and choosing. I can love that one. I can hate that one. I can love that one. I can neglect that one. You will love all the saints, all the children of God. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 4 again, the latter part of verse 4, the love which ye have to all the saints. Not only a section of the saints, a few of the saints, a minority of the saints, the love which ye have to all the saints. Verse 8, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. Not love in the flesh, love in the spirit. Not love according to human endeavor. Just I will try my best to love him. He's not lovable, but I will try my best. But your love in the spirit. This is a kind of love shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Your love in the spirit. Number three. Paul the Apostle said, 
Number one, that you have received the gospel by faith. Number two, it results in love. Number three, it rests in hope. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Here Paul the apostle talked about something very essential. You see, the sinner is hopeless. The sinner has no hope of the future. The sinner does not have anything. He's looking forward to. He's only living for the very moment because he said, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. He has no hope in life. He has no hope in death. You see, it is like this. The unbelievers, you ask them, and you say, what are you going to do? Well, if he's young, he says, I'm going to go to school. When you pass out, what do you do after that? He says, I hope, I think I'll get a good job for myself. After that, what are you going to do? I'm going to try to buy a vehicle. After that, I'll get married. I, what do you do after that? I may be able to build a house. After that, what will happen? Maybe I will establish on my own and become self-employed. After that, what will you do? I will get married and raise up children. After that, what are you going to do? I guess I'll become old. After that, what are you going to do? Well, I guess I will die like other people. After that, what? Now it's blank. No hope. No future. He doesn't know what is going to happen at that point. But you know the believer? He has hope in Christ. And he rests in hope. It is that hope that makes him to be able to go on. He may have stress. He may have strain. He may have difficulties. He may have problems in the world. But there is hope within him. That there is something laid up for him in heaven. Look at it again. Colossians chapter 1 verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Therefore the believer actually rests in hope. And this triad, I'm sure you've known of this triad before, faith, love, and hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And now abide it, faith, hope, and charity. These three, for the greatest of these is charity. And Paul, talking about the gospel in relationship to the Colossians, said, you have received it by faith. And it has resulted in love. And number three, it makes you to rest in hope. And as we look at the word of God, we see the real hope of the believer. Let us look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved for you in heaven. Think about it this way. You have traveled to a far place. You left home. And the information that is reaching home is that conditions are bad. Conditions are poor. You do not have enough to yourself. And it appears even completely dangerous for you to remain where you have been in that far away place. And eventually, your father, being a rich man, he wrote a letter to you. And he said, I've heard of your condition. And I've seen that you have not, your life has not been a, a thing you have enjoyed completely. And I just want to tell you that we have built a place for you. Because we want you to be able to live like the child of a king, the child of a rich man. Therefore now, get ready and leave that place where you are. And to tell you the fact, your senior brothers and their sisters, they are all waiting for you here. They are always looking for the day when you will come back home. There's a lot of fellowship waiting for you. We hear you have been disappointed by friends and neighbors over there in the far country where you are. Come back home. All the people that love you, they are waiting for you. And the best meals you ever took, everything is waiting for you. The people that will serve you, come back and come and enjoy the rest of your life. When you got that letter, you knew the name and the signature of your father. And you said, you said, this is my father. 
it is a real, true, genuine signature of my father writing to me saying, everything is waiting for me at home where I will be loved. I'm now going. Then you pack your, the little things you add. You got into a vehicle. As you are coming on the way, things difficult. You didn't have enough money to be able to feed yourself on that long journey. You didn't have enough people that will make the journey easy for you. But the comfort is this. You will pull out the letter and you will read and look at all the things that are waiting for you when you get back home and you will be counting the miles. You will say, it will soon be over. The stress, the strain, the difficulty, the heat, and the hunger, and the hatred of people, and the trials and the affliction, you, pick, you pull out the letter, you say, it will soon be over. You know what that is? You have hope that at the end of the journey, there's something waiting for you. The believer is a pilgrim in this world. We've got a letter from home saying, the father says he knows what we're going through. He knows that things are not actually what they could be here because there is a devil, there's an adversary that is going to and fro, going up and down, seeking whom he may devour. He knows about the persecution. He knows about the difficulty. He knows about the dangers in the world. And he says, just keep on on your journey. We're waiting for you. A mansion is getting ready for you. Jesus who loved you, you've been wanting to see his face long, long time. Is expecting you. The company of angels and your senior brothers and sisters who have gone home before you, they're all waiting for you. He says, you have this hope in you because there is an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. But look at all the other people that are traveling because they are traveling too. The sinners are also traveling. They are getting old. And they are going to leave this place whether they like it or not. The only problem with them is that when they reach the end of their journey, there's no accommodation waiting them. There's no lover of their soul waiting for them. And there is no peace or bliss waiting for them. There is no paradise or enjoyment waiting for them. At the end of the journey, they fall into the pit and they get uh, into hellfire. They will suffer forever and forever. But for us who are pilgrims on the way, we have hope of the future. You know, when a child is uh, misbehaving and is doing things that will hinder him to make progress in the future, the father will say something. The father will say, my child, when are you going to learn not to sacrifice the future on the altar of the present? The meaning of that is this. Look, you are sacrificing the future. You are spoiling the future. If you continue like this, self-indulgent, and you are taking everything you want in the present time now, and you cannot look at the future and endure and make sure you strive to become a better person, your future will be terrible. You are sacrificing the future on the altar of the immediate. But you know what the believer is doing? The believer is willing to sacrifice anything in the present because of the future. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 24 by faith. When Moses was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He was willing to sacrifice the present for the enjoyment of the future. That's what the believer is always doing. The believer will sacrifice anything that will hinder him so that his future hope will not be destroyed. So, the gospel is received by faith. It results in love. It rests in hope. Number four, it reaches the world. Let us look at Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 6. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world. Here Paul the Apostle said, the gospel is not a local sect. That the gospel is a saving, redemptive truth that reaches the world. He said, it is not only that you have received that gospel as it is good for you, it's also good for the rest of the world because actually the gospel is for the whole world. What does the Bible say? Look at it in Romans chapter 1. 
Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 8, that the gospel reaches the world. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And in John chapter 1, verse 9, we're told of Jesus Christ, the light not only of the Jews, the light not only of the Gentiles, the light not only of the rich or the poor, the light not only of a section of the world, the light of the whole world. John chapter 1, verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In John chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore, the gospel is for the whole world. That's why Jesus himself said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It reaches the world. Number five, in Colossians chapter one, reading verse six, which is common to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you. It reproduces fruit. You see, when a person actually has the gospel, he'll bear the fruit of repentance, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of godliness and holiness. It says, it bringeth forth fruit as it does in you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 6, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy, with joy of the Holy Ghost. Talking to the Thessalonian believers, Paul the Apostle said, when the gospel came to you, it changed you and turned you around. And instead of following the prophecies or predictions of soothsayers, now you are following the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of following the principles of life of the heathens and pagans and idol worshippers, now you are following the light you have received from the example of the apostles, the preachers that have preached unto you. Instead of following the course of this world, instead of being obedient to the, to the spirit that now walk in the children of disobedience, and instead of following the broad way, the way of perdition, you are now following the apostles who have preached the gospel to you, and you are following the Lord. You are now walking in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ with joy of the Holy Ghost. You see, that's what the gospel does in our lives. Instead of following our parents who do not know the Lord, instead of following the way of society that the people that do not know the Lord, instead of following the proverbs and the principles and the, and the patterns of the unbelievers and the heathens and the pagans in society, we are now following the Lord. And we are following the word of the Lord, and we are following the good examples we have in the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the joy of the Holy Ghost. In verse 7, so that ye were examples to all that believe in, Ma in Macedonia and Achaia. These people, the result in their lives is that the fruit of the gospel, the fruit of righteousness, was not being reproduced in their lives. In verse 8, for from you sounded out. The word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Apostle Paul said that the gospel has so worked in you, the, apostle, uh, the, the, word, the gospel rather, has so worked in you, and the gospel has so changed and transformed your life, and everybody knows of that, trans knows of that transformation and of that change. That even when we go to other places to preach, we do not need to preach anything because your life has brought them under conviction. Your life has been so good an example to them, they now know the difference between life and darkness. They now know the difference between Christianity and the superstitions they were following. Verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living 
and the true God, it brought forth fruit in their lives. In Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now, being made free from sin, ye became servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. It means that these people, the gospel brought fruit in their lives. It should reproduce the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Philippians 1, 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Then in Colossians again, chapter 1. Here Paul the Apostle re re revealed another aspect, another dimension of the gospel. And he tells us in this verse 6 of Colossians chapter 1, which has come to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. That the gospel is rooted in grace. That all we have received is by the grace of God. And this gospel we're talking about is not rooted in the works of men, in the works of the law, in what you could do for yourself to make yourself get to heaven because you can never do it. It is by the grace of God. The gospel is rooted in grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life down to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. It is the grace of God. When we get saved, it's the grace of God. We get sanctified, the grace of God. We get baptized in the Holy Ghost, we do not merit the power. It is the gift of God that if you will ask, how much more will your Father, which is in heaven, give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him, not to them that merit the power. We never merit anything from the Lord. From the beginning of the Christian life, of the Christian race, to the very end of that life and race, it is all by grace. The grace of God alone. This is what Paul the Apostle brought out beautifully. In Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 4. Now, to him that walketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. That what it means is that if it is by your good works to become saved, if it is by your good works to are able to get to heaven, then it is no more of grace. It is by marriage. But salvation is by grace. And if you know that, all you need to do is to repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, But to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then on the circumcision only? Or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that by faith, that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So then, it is the grace of God that makes us to be able to see the face of God in glory. Grace is at the heart of the gospel. Through the gospel, grace gives us what we do not merit. We do not merit forgiveness, that's what we are given. We do not merit peace of mind, that's what we are given. We do not merit a place in heaven, but that's what God has given us. We do not merit reconciliation, or we do not merit relationship and fellowship with the Lord, but that's what we have. 
not because we deserve it, but because of the grace of God alone. What God has done in salvation is this. What you deserve, he doesn't give that to you. What you don't deserve is what he gives to you. As a sinner, you deserve eternal punishment, but he doesn't give that. As a sinner, you do not deserve fellowship with him and heaven at last, but that's exactly what he gives you. By his grace, only his sovereign grace, we have been forgiven and we have the salvation of the Lord. Now we are redeemed. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. As ye also learnt of Epaphras, a dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Here Paul the Apostle says the gospel is reported by men. Paul the Apostle was telling the Colossian Christians, he said, you would have died in your superstition, paganism, and hedonism. But then a report came to you that Christ has been raised up, a light of the world, the light of the world the light of the Gentiles, that the people that sat in darkness saw a great light. Epaphras had about it in Asia Minor when he came to Ephesus, when he came to Paul the Apostle, and now he took that to the Colossians and he reported to them. He said, those Colossians did not have to perish and die in the darkness of paganism, hedonism, and superstition, that they can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ you are in the burning house and you had a report that the Savior is just at the door. And he's wanting you to jump out of that place from the height where you are and jump into the loving hands of the Savior because he will rescue you. You will not have known that the person to rescue you, to save you is there were it not for the report you heard from Epaphras. You have been thinking that there is a great God between simple humanity and holy almighty God. And you didn't know that the bridge had not been made, that now we can cross over. We do not have to perish with the people of the world with simple humanity. Jesus Christ is a bridge between humanity and almighty God. And we can cross over, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Paul the, Paul the apostle said, it is reported by men. Because it is through that report that we hear and we become saved. Let us look at Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and verse 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be saints? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see, the preachers, they report what has happened on the cross of Calvary. They report that now we can be saved. By the preaching of the gospel, now we can be saved because it has pleased God. Look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew knew not, knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It is because the gospel is preached by men, reported by men. That is why the people that have been lost, the people that have been hopeless, now they can call upon the Lord and be saved. And it is ours now. You have now got the gospel if you are born again. It is for you too to go out and report to other people that Calvary has broken down the wall of partition between God and man. Now we can be saved. Now we can be rescued. Now we can come into relationship and into fellowship with the Lord. In Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, preaching the gospel. They that were scattered abroad, they took the report all about. Jesus is risen from the dead. Because he lives, now we have hope in the Lord. Because he lives, now we can be saved. You take the report everywhere you go that now people do not have to remain servants and slaves and captives of Satan. 
about the good news. Remember the good news. Remember the gospel is the word used by the person that is running from the battlefield. And it says, gospel, gospel, gospel. We have won. We are not going to remain captives of the enemy nation because of the best news, the greatest news, the news of victory. And the news of victory is coming from Calvary. The news of victory is coming from where Christ died on the cross. And now we have the report we can bear to other people. We can say, gospel, gospel, the good news and the glad tidings. You don't have to perish in sin because Christ has died so as to take all our sins away. And in Psalm 68, verse 11, the Lord gave the word, and great was the company of those that published it. And the Lord is saying to you tonight, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be damned. Let us rise up and tell the Lord, if we have received the gospel, let us find out, have we received by faith? Is it uh, resulting in love? Are we resting in hope? Are we reaching the world? Are we reproducing the fruit? Is it rooted in the grace of God? Are we reporting it everywhere we go that the people do not have to perish? They can come to the Lord and they can be saved. Let us ask for the grace of God that they will help us. That they will help us. That they will help us. So that we will receive the gospel fully by faith. Jesus died for you. You do not have to perish. That's the gospel. The glad tidings, the, ble the best news, the greatest news, the news of victory. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's the grace of God. Even though you do not merit, you do not deserve salvation, God gives it to you free of charge. It's available. Believe and thou shalt be saved. Believe and thou shalt be saved. Jesus is the bridge between the sinners and the holy God. Believe that Jesus Christ has stepped on the bridge. And run into the hands of the Lord. Forsake your sin. Do not get drowned in the sea of wickedness and sin and evil. The rope has been given to you. Hold on to that rope and Jesus will pull you to the shore. Do not remain in the burning house. Do not remain in the burning world. Do not remain under the fiery indignation and the wrath of God. Escape for your life and jump into the hands of Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It will result in love in your life. You will love Jesus, you will love God, you will love the brethren. And it will rest in hope. You will know at the end of the journey, a loving Father is waiting for you. A loving Savior is waiting for you. And brothers and sisters who have gone before you will be waiting for you. You have hope of inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And it will reach the world, reach the world for the gospel. It will reproduce fruit, the fruit of righteousness in your life. It will be rooted in the grace of God and reported by men. You will report it all about that Jesus died for sinful men. Receive that gospel and proclaim that gospel.